Please turn in the back of your Psalter hymnals to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 29. That is page 885. Our first worship service features doctrinal preaching. We preach doctrine. I saw a hat that to this day I'm still tempted to buy. On the bill of the hat, it says, Make Theology Great Again. That's my kind of hat. I hope that's your kind of hat because that's why we have doctrinal preaching, theological preaching in our first worship service because we believe in truth and we believe that truth is not fundamentally subjective, it's objective and coherent and can be understood and you can benefit from it. I'll a ask the question in the bold and then together we'll answer the, answer the questions in <coughs> the fine print. It's page 885. Question 78. Do the bread and the wine become the real body and blood of Christ? No. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into Christ's blood and does not itself wash away sins, but is simply a divine sign and assurance of these things, so too the holy bread of the Lord's Supper does not become the body of Christ itself. Even though it is called the body of Christ, in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. Question 79. Why then does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood or the new covenant in his blood? And Paul used the words a participation in Christ's body and blood. Christ is good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that just as bread and wine nourish the temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood are the true food and drink of our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance and that all of his suffering and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and made satisfaction for our sins. Now turn in your Bibles now, if you would, to Matthew chapter 26. We'll be reading verses 26 through 29. The, e the ESV titles this little piece, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray you would grant us illumination of thy Holy Spirit, the illumination and power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit in the preaching of your word and in the reception of it. May we attend to it for what it is, the words of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So we continue to explore this very rich topic of the Lord's Supper. We have one more sermon on the Lord's Supper. It will be next week on who to be admitted to the table. But last week, I preached a bit of a defensive sermon against Rome and against Eastern Orthodoxy in favor of the Reformed understanding from Scripture of the Lord's Supper. Uh, today, uh, we'll more squarely focus on what we understand Scripture to mean when it calls the bread his body, when it calls the cup his blood. The high point 
or the culminating peak of the movement of our liturgy here uh, is the Lord's Supper. We culminate our worship up high as we lift up our hearts to Him. Uh, the reason uh, for this uh, is its meaning. The Lord's Supper is focused in communion with Christ. Where corporately we are taken in and corporately we take in Jesus Christ and Him crucified and find therein intimacy with the Lord. Intimacy in Christ crucified. And here in this table of the Lord, He sets out to us and persuades us of His redeeming love and His body and His blood. And, and He draws us into Himself even as uh, uh, we receive Him as He brings us to Him. Now remember, uh, there are three stages in our liturgy. Three distinct stages as we worship together. Uh, there is the stage of uh, the baptismal font from the uh, sin offering of the Old Testament where we come and we are cleansed. Then there is the stage of the ascension offering. The sacrifice is cut up and ascends into the heavenly in smoke. And that is a picture of the Word of God that chops us up and transforms our lives into its heavenly likeness. And thirdly, we are transformed as we commune with Christ, seen in the peace offerings of the Old Testament, the one offering where the people actually ate of that particular offering. And we are, as it is, drawn upward. The, the sweep uh, uh, every Sunday is a sweep upward into heavenly communion with Jesus Christ on Mount Zion. So let's now drill down into the meaning of of this sacrament. If you have your bulletins, you have an outline uh, for you uh, to help you to follow along in today's message. The first point is the meaning of Christ's words. What did he say? Take, eat, this is my body. Drink of it, this is my blood. Now if we read Christ's words literally and physically, if that's how we read them, then a miracle must occur upon each celebration of the Lord's table. But is this the likely meaning of Jesus' words? And the answer is no. But then you might answer, well, why then? Well, the reason is quite simple. If you look in John chapter 6, which we've already done, you will find that Jesus said, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Those were the straight-up direct words of Jesus Christ. Now we know that Christ in John 6 was not speaking of eating and drinking of him literally. He tells us that he was speaking of eating and drinking of him spiritually by faith. We find that in verses 35 and 63. So too here, in the institution of the table in Matthew, Christ was not about to contradict what he said in John 6. It's vital for us to understand. Jesus is using literal language to communicate a spiritual message to be received by faith. So that the meaning is not physical and corporeal. Jesus' words are spiritual in nature. So when it comes to feeding and drinking of Him, as we see in John chapter 6, and therefore the bread and wine are mere symbols. Symbols of a spiritual reality of communion with Christ. And therefore, the meaning of is not miraculous. There's absolutely 100% nothing miraculous occurring in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Now, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox branches both teach that a miracle occurs with the bread and the wine, 
so that it is to be literally identified as Christ's body and blood. This is preposterous, and it results in idolatry. This is part and parcel of why we have the Protestant Reformation. But let's think about this for a moment. Let's ponder this. What is a miracle? A miracle is a sensory suspension or alteration of ordinary providence. A miracle is a sensory and blatant contradiction of ordinary providence. If suddenly... One of you levitated up in the air, was floating around and floated around this auditorium to float back in your chair. We would say, well, wow, it must be a miracle. It's supernatural. People don't ordinarily do that when we gather. Okay? Sensorily determined and seen. Let's look at John chapter 2. For Jesus' first miracle, John chapter 2, what was it? The changing of the water into wine. The changing from water, the servants verified, they poured water in. The changing to wine, that was verified by the master of ceremonies, a sensory miracle. You can see the master of ceremonies. He receives the water that was then made wine in his glass. He swirls it around. He sticks his nose into it to smell the bouquet. He swirls it to see the legs of the wine. He tastes the wine. He swishes it around in his mouth. He swallows it down. And what does he say? That is the best wine ever. You've saved the best for last. It's the best. A sensory identification that it was changed. Well, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox teach that though the bread and wine are miraculously transformed into the body and blood of Christ, the sensory, the taste, the texture remains ordinary bread and wine. Bread and wine. There's no sensory change. A miracle has occurred. The bread and wine has become the body and blood of Christ. But it's not sensorily determined. It still tastes like bread and wine. Could you imagine now the master of ceremonies in John chapter 2 tasting the wine, which still tasted like water, and then remarking, by faith, you've saved the best wine for last. Could you imagine him tasting that and it was still water and going, wow! That's the best. By faith. <laughs> no, you cannot. He said what he said because of why? Because it was not merely the best wine. It tasted like and was the best wine. And it was a true sensory miracle. The Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox want you to believe in a miracle that is contrary to your senses because we said so. Well, that is neither true nor miraculous by definition. Yet the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches continue to pass off bread and wine by faith which is in reality foolishness, that it really is the actual physical flesh and blood body of Jesus Christ, though all of its properties are bread and wine. You stuck on that? Should be. Secondly, what if it did become actual flesh and blood of Christ? Let's just, what if it did? What if it did become the flesh and blood of Christ 
that communicates came and ate and drank. What then would happen? How does eating flesh and blood impact the soul? You have physical elements that are broken down and digested physically, chemically. The whole idea is gross. The Jews, misunderstanding Jesus, they thought it was gross when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. The world, looking in upon the church, thinks it sounds gross. And brothers and sisters, that is all due to misinformation. Because eating something fleshly has nothing to do with the soul. It has to do with the body. The body just merely breaks down the physical. It's not a direct link to the soul. But thank God the Reformed Church is the spiritual department of misinformation. We are the ones that are coming along and saying, look, uh, the emperor has no clothes. All that is is a piece of bread and a piece of wine and a drink of wine by sensory determination. We're the little children coming around going, hey, tastes like bread, Mom. I had my first communion. Tasted just like wine. Ooh, bitter. You see, the Lord's Supper is not a miracle. And we are fools to believe it is just because the Church of Rome and its priests says so. It's hocus pocus without the illusion. So nowhere does Scripture indicate the perpetual occurrence of miracles throughout the Church's history, especially not in the ordinary celebration of bread and wine. Then what does it mean? Didn't Jesus say? This is my body. Didn't Jesus say, this is my blood? The third point in your outline, the meaning of sacraments. The meaning is participation, union and communion with Christ. The meaning of the sacraments are derived from a correlation. <coughs> <coughs> Caddy gives some question, 78. It says, does the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ? No. The answer is, so to the holy bread of the Lord's Supper does not become the body of Christ itself, even though it's called the body of Christ, in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. Rather, wh why then does Christ say these words, this is my body, this is my blood, Question 79 answers that Christ has good reasons for it. He wants to teach us something. That just as the bread and wine nourish the temporal body, so too his crucified body and poured out blood are the true food and drink of our souls. But more important, he wants to assure us by, the, by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his body and his blood. There's a correlation, you see, between the sign and the thing signified. Bread and wine nourish the body. Christ's crucified body and shed blood are true food for the soul. Soul and body are distinguished. The event is correlative one to the other. The bread and wine are static signs. They do not change. But they point to a reality that is greater. Something else that is correlative along with those signs. But that's not all. <clears throat> They're not merely signs. <clears throat> and if they are merely signs, we are just left to ourselves when we eat the bread and drink the wine. We're just left to ourselves to sit there and think, ponder, remember in our own heads. And that is called the memorialistic view of the Lord's Supper, and that is not our view. <clears throat> Rather, 
The bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper are means of grace which the Holy Spirit employs. The Holy Spirit employs those means to bring about in our relationship to Christ vital union and communion with Jesus Christ in His body and blood. We share in His body and blood, <clears throat> as the Catechism says. Which brings us back to John 6. Christ's words <clears throat> were spiritual. Eat my flesh, drink my body, and they had to do with faith. Verse 35, John 6. So same here, Christ's sacrament is spiritual. It's of the Holy Spirit who's at work, who is applying Christ and His cross to our souls. Christ comes to us as we sit here in our chairs. Christ personally draws near to us as his representative, the elder of the church, brings to you, draws near to you bread and wine, so Christ is drawing near to you to bind you to himself by the Holy Spirit that is grace. And then we, by faith, we reflexively draw near to him as we reach out and receive and participate, share in, and commune in his body and blood. So the sacrament is a sign of the thing signified, and yet the Holy Spirit works through that sacrament so that what is signified is brought home to us by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to our souls. And therein God confirms His grace to you. What a wonderful confirmation it is to our weak faith. And God gives to us the body and blood of Christ to communion. This question number 79 answers that question. We share by the Holy Spirit in communion. A correlative event. The sign that we see, the, sing, the thing signified, which occurs invisibly as the Holy Spirit employs the means of grace in our souls. <clears throat> now, because of this spiritual close union between the sign and the thing signified, right? There's a close union between those two. They're not just two phenomenons that are separate, like two train tracks. There's a union between them. So because of that union between them in the Holy Spirit, the sign then becomes spoken as if it is the thing signified because of the close union between the two. So Christ serving us with himself who draws near to us says to us, this is my body, this is my blood. And so the Heidelberg Catechism says this very thing, this makes this very point in the very last line of the answer to 78, in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. The language of sacraments is the, thing, is the sign is spoken of as the thing signified because of the close union between the two and the way the Holy Spirit uses the one to bring about the sanctification of the other. So the meaning of the sacrament is profound. It is the means and moment where we richly commune with Christ in His death and thus in His resurrection presence and fellowship through those means. Remember Luke chapter 24, the post-resurrection Emmaus Road, when Christ broke the bread at the inn? The travelers therein recognized him in the breaking of the bread, and he vanished. See, the post-resurrection breaking of bread is intended for us to see Christ in the sacrament, in the breaking of bread. And yet, he's not there visually, physically. He has vanished physically. Yet in communing with Him and seeing Him in the Lord's Supper, what happens? We are transformed by that sight, as Paul says, from glory to glory. 
The Lord's Supper is the Holy Spirit's means to confirm grace to us, and by that very grace it is confirmed to our souls by the Holy Spirit, we are transformed as we are brought nigh to Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us not take lightly and dismiss the spiritual reality of the Lord's Supper and its intended role to show us Christ, to draw us near to Christ in union and communion, and therein to transform us after the very one the Holy Spirit enables us to see and to commune with in the heavenly places through His Supper. Now let me end here. Point four here, the meaning for believers. I want us to note before we pass, the vast difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant and New Covenant move from a a pervasively pictorial environment, a sensual environment in the Old, to a simple, focused, spiritual environment in the New. It is a move from the poly-sensible to the rich, and mono-spiritual. That is, that is the redemptive historical nature of the transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant. Moving from a full-on feast of the family Passover to a simple corporate celebration of bread and wine. Moving from maximum sensibilities and minimal spirituality the new covenant of minimal sensibility and maximal spirituality. This overwhelmingly new accent of the new covenant for us is an accent that lands on the invisible reality of tapping into the profound union and communion with God through the work of Christ that is administered to our souls by the Holy Spirit, to feed us, to fill us by faith. Through faith, we feed on Christ and we are nourished within. By bread and wine, Christ reaches out to us through His cross. He speaks to us. He says to us, I love you. Redeeming love is on display as we consider the crucified body and poured out blood of Jesus. This is the driving proclamation, the love of God for sinners. And that meal enfolds us and envelops us, and Christ therein enfolds and envelops us to Himself as resurrection and life. A new covenant, a covenant of forgiveness, a covenant of God dwelling with and in His people, wherein we abide in Him. It's covenant binding together. God dwelling with His people. The consummation of the covenant. You can read about it in the end of the book of Revelation. The book, the precious Lord's Supper celebrates that reality for us even now. Thus for the believer, the Lord's Supper does something for him. We are all weak in faith. And the Lord's Supper confirms and strengthens our weak faith so that we come to the table confidently and we come into the holy place confidently. And we come to Him who is the resident of that holy place, the High Priest Jesus Christ, so that we might receive in the Supper mercy and grace to help in our time of need, which is now. The believer comes to the table weighed down with the weight of his sin. He looks and sees what has happened to Christ on his cross to deal with his sin. And he's therein he is raised up. Him who is weighed down is raised up because Christ's cross is sufficient. And thus he joins confidently with other sinners in the moment of sharing that table and says we lift up our hearts to God in heaven. And they declare together, we, 
We the most unlovely. We the ethically ugly are nevertheless thoroughly loved by the triune God, the thrice holy God, and they see Jesus concretely spread before them in bread and wine and thus bound to him in reflexive covenantal love one to the other. So they instantly learn not only that Christ loves them, but that Christ loves his people. For they share the table together. My fellow communicants in Christ are loved by him. We who are many are one in the love of Christ. And so to conclude here, the Lord's Supper is a participation, it's a fellowship, it's a sharing, it's a communion in Christ's body and blood. It is a community, it is a communion of the community. It is a communion of the one loaf, many parts, a single loaf. It is a together event. It is a covenantal event on earth until Jesus Christ comes back and he will share it with us in glory. Now, the Lord delivers in communion for our comprehension and for our confirmation his redeeming love for our souls. And this is to impact us. The Apostle Paul in his two very discreet and thoughtful prayers in the book of Ephesians, praise this, and this is administered to us. This is realized to us in the context of the Lord's Supper. And I conclude with this, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive its name, that according to the riches of His glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. You see it? Comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let us pray.